Everybody. Welcome to Guided Listening This Week. I'm Jeff Antoniak. I'm excited to be here with you. Um, we are going to be listening to da, 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 me, a gig I did last Saturday. And I thought it might be interesting to listen to uh, myself. And I haven't really listened to this track very much. I hope I picked a good one. Um, and the idea is I know the band. I know what I was thinking as I was playing. And, uh, and so, you know, hopefully you'll find uh, this interesting, a different take on uh, things. And I hope I don't stop this video in the middle because uh, listening to myself is sometimes uh, a difficult thing to do. <laughs> you probably know what I'm talking about. Uh, two big announcements. First of all, for the last month, we have been running a contest for a winner of Jazzwire, six months of subscription to Jazzwire. That's uh, $300 American. It's a $50 a month subscription. We have hundreds of people from all over the world, 25 different countries, um, working together inside Jazzwire. And so I was eager to, uh, to get more of you folks inside. So we're going to do this contest again, maybe in a month or two. But uh, we had many, many, many people uh, enter. And so thank you for sending in your information. Uh, the person that won is Andy Ferris. This is somebody who I think I've communicated with on Facebook, but we've never met, I don't think. Uh, maybe we met at the saxophone symposium. Andy lives in Virginia, which is not terribly far from here. Uh, saxophone player, piano player, and I believe he's retired, uh, a retired army musician. So that's very cool. So Andy will be reaching out to you and getting you all the information about getting up and running in Jazzwire. For those of you that want to know more, take the free trial. It's for a month, you can be inside and looking at what we're doing, looking at the lessons that we're doing currently, and of course, our huge library of hundreds and hundreds of lessons before this. Okay, the last thing I want to mention is we are doing our first international workshop. So that's coming up in June of this year in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, my hometown. We're going to be doing it at Grant at McEwen University. I totally misspoke. I was going to call it Grant McEwen because uh, I went to this school way back when, when it was a college. It's now a full-blown university. Great program. Uh, they are very kindly going to be our host. This is on June 22nd, 23rd. It's a saxophone workshop but it's an improvisation workshop. So it's two full days. Saxophone players are there all day. And then we're opening it up to other instruments. So brass, all the rhythm section instruments, guitar, drums, bass, piano, uh, for the afternoon improv part. So registration is open. Uh, we have a very limited number of spots. They're going to go really, really quickly. So if you're up in, uh, in Canada, in Alberta, in Western Canada, that, that zone, I would love to see you there. So grab a spot very quickly. Okay, let's jump into this. So this is uh, the song Body and Soul, one of my favorite ballads to play, but it's also uh, very challenging. There's a lot of chords in it. There's a lot of different key centers. You can stub your toe pretty easily. So I like that challenge, but, <laughs> you know, like it in that sort of masochistic way. Great band. It's Wade Beach on piano. He's the uh, jazz piano professor at George Mason University. It's Frank Russo on drums. Frank and I play together a lot. We used to teach together at Towson University. And the great James King on bass. James uh, used to be in Stanley Turrentine's band. James did gigs with Elvin Jones, like that. James has played with about everybody. Gary Bartz, you name it, on and on. James has played with them, so it's always a trip to have uh, James in the band. So let's jump into this, and uh, let's see what we get. This is Body and Soul. This is recorded live uh, last weekend, February 2024, at Mr. Henry's in Washington, D.C. <laughs> nice strong count off. That guy knows what he's doing. So we have brushes on the drums and listen to James. So it's mostly half notes. So it's a beautiful, slow ballad tempo, ballad feel. Embellish the melody a little bit at the end of the first day. melody is so beautiful. A little Joe Henderson nod there. I don't want to get too far from it. In 
embellishing the melody, but coming back to it. So I left it a bit, but wanted to come back. Here's the bridge. I remember that low note, a low A. I remember being very nervous about it because I was playing a different saxophone this night and I really had my air and my embouchure set. I'm very thankful it came out. I was, I remember thinking about it in the moment. So now, I'm kind of starting to solo on this last day section. Using moments from the melody, but I'm really embellishing pretty far. top of the second chorus. We're still in the ballad feel, right? Frank still with the brushes, but do you hear him uh, experimenting with the hi-hat? He was embellishing with the open hi-hat. Very cool. Now, I'm playing a fair amount of double time. Things like that. Ba -doo -da, ba -ba -doo -da. Even if it's not a million notes, I'm implying double time. Notice what the band is not doing, going into double time. It's not all that fast stuff, but the band is keeping it a ballad. And so, I love this. That I can get excited, I can play double time, I can play more, I can play out of time but they don't necessarily go right with me immediately. They're keeping the ballad feel there so I can play over it. So that's a good lesson. Um, a very novice rhythm section doesn't even know that double time is a thing. A good intermediate rhythm section knows it's a thing and they sort of excitedly go to double time really quickly, immediately. The moment they hear it, they're there. A super pro rhythm section doesn't get excited about what the soloist is doing. So Frank got some rhythms going in the solo, but James stayed right there. Wade's comping was stayed in the ballad zone. I loved that they didn't follow me. Bass solo. Is Frank playing? They're drums. I'm looking over at the video. He's not even playing. Duo, bass, and piano. What a great decision for the drums to lay out. It made it so much quieter, more intimate. It focuses things on the bass solo. And it achieves one other thing we're gonna hear in a second. What it achieved is not only did he drop out, but Frank gets to come back in. And the moment Frank came in, it changed the sound again. It raised the solo up, right? The energy came up. So um, it's such a big deal for a drummer to drop out because in that moment, it changes the sound of the room. But there's the other side of that coin. When they come in, oh my gosh, it's huge. And it's still single time. No double time so far, right? And James is quoting the melody. Quoted the melody and now he's left the melody again. Cool thing to do. And that's giving the rest of us a hint, his solo's done. Top of the next chorus. Piano. Still a ballad feel. Wade's playing a lot of double time, a lot of fast stuff like I was in my solo. And James and Frank know that maturity, right? They know we don't need to go there. 
if Wade wanted them to go to double time, there are musical things he could do to hint at it, but he's not really, so I think their decision is perfect. And, and now James is playing double stops, mixing up the rhythms. So they're getting, they're definitely getting involved, the bass and the drums with the piano solo, but not in a way that they go double time. Now here, I remember thinking, this tune's getting a little long. So I came in at the bridge. I sort of cut Wade's solo off. And I remember thinking, should I come in with the melody? But I decided to come in swinging for the fences. I wanted this to be the loudest part of the tune. So this was a decision. And then of course, you can hear me bringing it down. And then the last A section. So the entire head out is actually just eight measures. Last eight of the tune. Now the trick is, how are we gonna end? We didn't talk about it. So I kept it in time here. A lot of people would retard there, but I decided, no, let's do a turnaround. I hinted at the note I wanted them to play. And I kept the time going to let them know. And now, you heard me go totally out of time. I threw the anchor out. They didn't know I was going to do that. play a bunch of wrong notes on the cadenza if you're a hip jazz guy, right? And again, that lowest note on the sax, but I was a little nervous that one was going to come out, but it came out great. All right. Well, it wasn't quite as painful as uh, as I thought it might be. Most uh, most musicians don't love hearing themselves uh, play back because all we hear are the mistakes that uh, you know that we didn't you know things that we didn't quite get going. Um, and and I, I mentioned a couple times I, I think I was playing a different horn. Um, I'm playing the Eastman the new Eastman 852. Uh, here it is. And uh, and I've been spending more time with this horn. And uh, I'm liking it a lot. So that's what you hear uh, on that recording. So this is, you know, the, the new one that they had come out. You know, I think it's been out a month or two. Uh, they're kind enough to send me one. And uh, I'm really loving it. So if you're, you know, looking, looking for a horn, this is one to compare. I compared it against all the new horns at the saxophone symposium a month ago and uh, came out pretty favorably i would say and a lot of people are pretty excited about it so uh but at the end of the day this isn't the horn i've been playing for uh decades and decades so uh so that's what you're hearing on the recording so i hope that was helpful it was interesting to listen back to that and i played gigs in the in the days between this one and that one but i remember moments like oh yeah i was very consciously thinking about my embouchure and air and support and my teeth on top of the mouthpiece. Like there were absolute moments where it's like, it was all mechanics. If, if it came out sounding beautiful and fluid and emotional and whatever, good. Cause I was pulling the wool over your eyes. I was absolutely working on mechanics in that moment. When, when I played such and such a line or such and such interesting thing, um, I was absolutely playing a lick that I can tell you where I transcribed it. I can tell you what, so I can, you know, we could go through the solo and I could point to, yes, this I got there. Yep, this I got there. I can tell you which album, which player I got that from, except for he used it in this way. I superimposed it in that way. So there was a lot of thought going on, but then there was also a lot of being in the moment. So the goal, I think, is always to be in the moment, but um, there's still a lot of thought as I do this, right? I think probably an Olympic ski champion, um, you know, they talk about being in the zone. They were just, you know, with the flow state, right? But then there are a lot of times where, oh, here's that gate coming up that kicked my butt yesterday. Let's make sure we, you know, whatever it is. So um, yeah. And they make it look easy, but they were sweating bullets going around that gate, right? So th that that's always going to go on, I think. 
So uh, as I said, hopefully that was interesting. Andy, congratulations for six months of Jazzwire. I can't wait to work with you a bunch inside Jazzwire. And for those of you that are up in the uh, Western Canadian, Albertan uh, zone, please consider coming to the saxophone and improvisation workshop for all instruments. And uh, Edmonton's really beautiful actually in June. So uh, I would uh, love for you to fly in and see me there. All right, everybody, take care. Have a great week.